I, I want to start with the story of your travel to Syria. Many of us here in the West would consider travel and especially overseas travel as a coming of age experience, a rite of passage, so to speak, into young adulthood. Why did you travel to Syria and why? And, and, and when? Um, I traveled to Syria. We'll start there. Um, really, as yes, it was definitely a, what ended up being a coming of age experience. Absolutely. Um, the story starts with a, a visit from a sheikha that came to the United States. Um, we learn later, actually, uh, you know, in terms of for medical treatment for her own self, that while being in our community, she was able to gather some of the women and girls of the community and say, you know, let's have a halakha, let's have a class together and, and, and see what's happening with American Muslims. What's, what's the story there? And I was so intrigued by this concept of a woman scholar. I was intrigued by the concept of, wow, there are such scholarly people who are not men, mashallah. And while that's wonderful that we have our shiuch, it was such a new experience for me. I was, um, a very young teenager, I want to say either I was 12 or 13 at the time. And I um, remember coming home telling my parents, wherever this person is from, and whatever she does, <laughs> whoever she is, and whatever it is, I want to go there. And I want to be like that. SubhanAllah. And it turned out that she was from visiting from Damascus, Syria. This is well before the war, of course. And my family is not Syrian, and so they thought it, this would be a very difficult thing to do, but they said, okay, and they noted it. <laughs> some some months later, not too long, much longer later, um, you know, my parents came to me and said, you know, when you told us you wanted to go to Syria to study, an opportunity has come up, would you like to go? And I thought, wow, they really listened to me, like they listened to 13-year-old kid <laughs> telling them they want to go halfway across the world, <laughs> mashallah. It turns out, of course, years later, I would find out that that particular sheikha had, um, you know, picked really some students to go and to study and to hopefully bring back knowledge to the United States and really be able to keep on the tradition of classical Islamic training, particularly amongst women. So that's my story of journey um, to Syria. It was not something where I thought one day I'd become a teacher or went to study for the for, for the you know betterment of really anyone other than my own self. But subhanAllah, the story there is when you do study, you have to pay forward what you've learned. And it's been a wonderful, just an amazing experience having really sat with women scholars and understood what that woman sisterhood, uh, scholarly sisterhood could actually look like. So where are you, where are you, where's 13-year-old Rania Awad meeting this Syrian scholar? What part of the U.S. is this happening? And what is the journey to Syria like? At that time, I was in the Midwest. My, we lived, my parents and I and my family, we lived in Michigan. So she was visiting Michigan at the time. And, um, and Michigan has been a wonderful doorway for a lot of people who have actually went to Syria to study. Um, alhamdulillah. What that journey has been like is um, a series of visits. For me, that's what it looked like. I went as a very young person and, um, my, you know, for a summer study, almost like a study abroad situation. I was 14 at the time. And my, um, and my desire was to stay there for an extended period of time, but I was very young and my folks were not <laughs> quite ready <laughs> for that. And so when I called them from Damascus on that first summer that I was there and said, can I stay longer? You know, or maybe I, my teenage self said something like, I, I plan to stay longer because you think, you know, you have the plans. <laughs> they said, oh, no, you're getting back on that plane and coming back. <laughs> and so alhamdulillah, I spent a, a, one summer that early, early on. Um, and then it was quite a bit of work, actually, to get back to Damascus. For me, it looked like a series of trips when my parents finally agreed again. And alhamdulillah, it was some years later, still in high school, but some years later. And um it was just interspersed between my high school studies, my college studies, my medical school studies. And the war didn't start until I was in my residency, actually. And I was still traveling back and forth, kind of juggling both, you know, my medical studies and my, uh, my dean studies. So it, it, sound, it sounds like th there is this young woman who's, you know, who has... Her heart is, is, is in her, her spiritual growth. She's, and she's physically, literally between two continents separated by a vast ocean. And there is this pull that's happening over there. And at the same time, there is the high school, the college and the med school happening. So how is this formation happening, you think? And how are you 
oh, what is the intellectual journey that's happening at this moment? For me, a lot of it was really um, immense identity building, honestly. You know, this is a time where when we talk about coming of age, it's also a coming of age in terms of you, who am I exactly? Not just my, the family I was raised in, not just my religion and my faith, my identity, um, the parts of me that are trying to grapple between my parents' culture and my American culture, the parts of me that's also trying to understand what does it mean to actually fully implement the religion the way we're taught it classically. Um, and then I'm traveling overseas and that's a whole other dynamic as well. So when you think about... Um, trying to integrate all those parts, there's funny things that happen. Of course, especially as young people, sometimes we get overly carried away <laughs> by certain things. And sometimes we have to understand like, okay, that was actually a cultural aspect or artifact, not the faith itself and, and, and such, you know. So anyhow, this, this um, journey for me was definitely the, the, my mindset at that point was um, I learned something so beautiful from one of those very early trips. And that was as a young person, do as much as you possibly can so that one day you don't look back and regret that you had missed out on any opportunities. And that was definitely my mindset. It was a go, go, go mindset of get as much as you possibly can. I had no idea. None of us had any idea the war would start in Damascus and we would be in, in Syria in general, and we would be prevented, subhanAllah, from such a beautiful place of knowledge and light in the Muslim world for so many years until till, till today. Um, None of us knew that. It was it was really more of a drive of we have to make sure that we can get as much as we're able to in that time where you have less responsibilities because the responsibilities only become more later. I I want to I want to circle back to your experience uh, in Syria just a little bit later, but I think because it's spirituality will probably weave in and out of our entire conversation. But let's fast forward to your medical school. You trained in Ohio, and then you did your residency and fellowship at Stanford. Why did you pursue specializing in mental health? That's a very good question. It actually directly ties to what we were just talking about, speaking of spirituality, subhanAllah. Um, I do have a roundabout story. I've shared it a little bit before of how um, my interest really was, was going into a completely different direction. I didn't set out to do mental health or psychiatry at first. Um, I had a strong interest in women's health, and that was the work I was doing. Um, and I uh, had geared up my entire medical school studies because you take your, you know, uh, when you come to do your practical portion of medical school, you choose certain rotations that are going to gear you for the next step. And I had chosen all of them to be obstetrics and gynecology. I thought that's definitely the work I was going to see myself doing into the future, subhanAllah. Allah had another plan, <laughs> mashallah. It was actually that having come back from my studies in Syria and starting to teach in the community, being asked to teach classes at halakas and various, um, you know, uh, spiritual and religious based courses, that it became really clear to me that actually a lot of the questions were beyond the textbook, beyond the halal and haram, beyond what does Islam say about X, Y, or Z. It actually was became clear that it was much more um, deeper questions, family questions, personal questions, things that actually were quite complicated sometimes. And I realized very quickly I was out of my depth. As much as I had studied it by that point, which was maybe over a decade by that point, I had not, it, it's, you're, you don't, if you haven't learned formally how to counsel and also what drives some of these questions that are coming forward. There's always a story behind the story. Mm -hmm. And an incident happened uh, locally here, subhanAllah, that actually turned everything for me. Um, and without going into too many details for confidentiality's sake, there was a young person in our community that experienced what today I can now have the language to explain was a psychotic break. Mm -hmm. But at that point in time, we didn't have the language. Nobody did. Nobody around me, none of the other religious instructors or faculties, or nobody had the knowledge to really explain what was this thing that was happening. And there's a, you know, <laughs> a beautiful connection with Nisa, actually, because um, one of your original founders, Dr. Rajab Ali, was actually the person who helped even put words to what was happening and explain that this was actually a medical psychiatric condition that needed immediate attention. And the religious folk and others, um, you know, and even just the general community members, we tend to do this thing where we say we see something that's not explainable. Uh, immediately so we go to the supernatural and we say oh this must be 
gin possession or it must be ayin or it must be one of these other factors. And so we want to treat it purely spiritually. And it was very eye-opening. And at that, in that in, in that entire incident, uh, my husband actually turned to me, and, who also was a teacher and is a teacher in the community, and said, "Look, Rania, if you really want to help this community and other communities, we really need people who have grounding in Islamic knowledge and studies to be able to understand mental health. This is going to—we need to bridge these two worlds together because there's very little bridging of them right now happening." And that changed my course of studies completely. Subhanallah. I almost at the last minute, <laughs> applied to psychiatry for my residency and landed in a field and in a world that was completely new to me once I got there and really had to do a lot of deep diving into our own traditions and understandings in our own classical texts and books and Islamic knowledge to really pull out what now, mashallah, is a treasure trove <laughs> related to mental health um, that wasn't apparent right away to me. Yeah. Well, let's, you know, speaking of taking a deep dive into technical know-how, can you help some of our audience, and myself included, actually, <clears throat> understand the difference between a, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, and a psychotherapist? If you can just start with the beginning of some of these terms. Of course, of course. I'll start with a psychiatrist. I myself am a psychiatrist, and that's a person who's gone through medical studies. They are an MD. They've gone through entire medical school. And they have specialized in psychiatry, but their doctorate degree, their medical degree allows them to be able to prescribe medications just like any other physician might. And also they have basic trainings in general medicine and in general surgery. They're able to, they've gone through all of that same training, but the specialty is in psychiatry. Whereas a psychologist is also somebody who has reached a doctorate level degree as well, but they have not gone through medical school. They have gone through a graduate school of psychology and their training is slightly different. They haven't done the full body system of what a physician may have, uh, but they are at a doctorate level and they are able to diagnose and they're able to do therapy, but they do not prescribe medications. A psychotherapist may be a psychologist as well, but they also may be someone who's at the master's level. So they've done two years of graduate school after their college studies and have done supervised hours for their licensure and they only do therapy. So I hope that's a bit of a helpful explanation. That is because I've also personally wondered what different roles are and what sort of help one should be seeking out for. And, and that brings me to my next question. How does one determine that they need help and what then should they do to ask for help? And where I'm asking this question, especially in the context of domestic violence. Right. And so when a person has experienced any sort of difficulty, domestic violence being one definitely such broadly and more broadly speaking than that abuse, and even more broadly speaking, any turbulence, any difficulty um, that's come forward, there are different specialties for different conditions. So for example, if a person has reached, has experienced, um, like the case I was mentioning earlier, something that's very um, difficult, like a psychotic break, at that point, you need to absolutely get to emergency care right away. And at that point, it really needs to be high level care. So psychiatric care will be necessary. If you also have, if, if it's not quite that level of difficulty, but it may be something that's um, moderate or mild even, please do not ignore those things. Those are things that actually need intervention as well, but they may not need a psychiatric emergency room or a physician per se. They may require therapy. So part of that would be actually reaching out to professional care. And often those who are trained know how to tell you, this is beyond my scope. Actually, we need to refer up. Or they may say, actually, what you need is more like therapy let me refer you to a therapist. So the first step really is, is even just taking that first step to be connected. And if you don't quite connect in the right direction, usually that professional could help you guide you to the next correct connection. So what should a patient expect when they walk into your clinic? So my clinic, my personal clinic, as you mentioned earlier, is through Stanford University. And in the community, I supervise the work that's at Maristan. So there's the different settings between something that happens at a big facility like Stanford, or if it's a community clinic like Maristan. There's some similarities, but there's also some differences. First step is always going to be the same. There's initial contact made. 
it's usually a phone call or if there's a form on their website that a person fills out and says, I'm in need of care. Usually there's an intake person that they'll speak to on the phone or we'll also give them forms to fill out. So the first thing to know is very logistical, that there is some paperwork involved. Usually a person doesn't pick up the phone and immediately get connected to a therapist or psychiatrist. There's usually some paperwork to do first. I say that only because I have found that sometimes people might find themselves in a real emergency situation. And we have to remind them that those acute, very emergency kind of issues require actually going to an urgent care or an ER or somewhere that has 24 care. The clinics that are out like my own or that in the community, whether it's Stanford or Mariston, are not set up in that way. They're set up for something that is much less, much less acute and so much less urgent. And so what happens is a person would call, fill out the paperwork, they would do their checking to make sure it all fits in terms of one's insurance, one's financial background, that the matching is done. And then from there has the very first session. And let's say they're assigned to me. I'll do an intake session with them. That first session is not a thera- is not therapy. It's actually just a lot of gathering information. What happened? What's your background? Who's your family? What's your family background? What happened to you before? Just lots of questions that helps us um, as the clinician understand who we're working with. And one of the most important questions is, what are you hoping to get out of this? Those are guiding questions. From there, we can decide, is there, for example, as a psychiatrist, somebody might have already medical or, you know, a medical background or medications they're taking. I take an entire history on that. And maybe that's, they need that in addition to the therapy. Maybe it's only a therapy situation where at that point we decide what kind of therapy is needed. So there's a lot of discussions in that very first session, which is more like an introductory session, a fit. Is it a good fit? Do I have what I can, what you need? And then from there, we decide on timings and locations and length of time we might work together. And that's typically how other clinicians do it as well with some slight variations. Um, And then the therapy starts from there. Help us us do away with some of the taboo or the stigma around mental health, especially having to do with therapy. Yeah, for me, I mean, I, I mentioned how um, when I was so new into the field and I have to say not just new, but very suspicious of the field, <laughs> Inshallah. I, like any other Muslim that I had grown up in my generation in my community that I had grown up in, um, there was just a lot of negativity around mental health, that this is not part of our deen. This is not something Muslims need, that this is not our background. This is a Western thing, or people would say it's an American thing as though we weren't Americans, subhanAllah, <laughs> or they would say some other thing. And that's just the mindset I personally had too. And and the reason that's important is when I entered into the field and it helps answer your question too, I had to literally deprogram myself from a lot of those stigmas myself. You know, I hadn't taken a single course in psychology in college because I thought what good Muslim girl needs a psychology class. (laughs) And Allah has a way of humbling you. Alhamdulillah. But honestly, it's, it's, um, it's uh, part of the, for me, what happened in the deep dive, deep dive that I spoke about is actually going into our tradition to understand, is there a pre- precedence for therapy in our Islamic tradition? Is this something that our scholars from before had even suggested? And I was so pleasantly amazed and surprised <laughs> at so many things that we uncovered in this process. And anybody who's interested can, is welcome to look at the work in my lab, the Stanford Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab, and all that we've unearthed over time. But one thing that I'll share right now out of a lot of many things is therapy. That Muslims were some of the very first people, if not to found certain types of therapy, they definitely expounded on it and used it heavily in their traditional Muslim societies and in their healing centers called the Madistans, which is, of course, the namesake of our organization. And that concept was so powerful to me because it shook so many of the stigmas and barriers that I personally had and others around me had too for talk therapy because we would be told things culturally from our parents and elders don't air your dirty laundry why are you talking to a stranger about things that are happening at home um, and in our family and so on you know of course worried about confidentiality 
what will the community hear if some of this was, you know, leaked out? That's a big thing that tends to come up for many people. And for others, it's just foreign. They were not used to <laughs> talking to others outside of the family about their issues. So for me, it was so powerful to see that this was something that not only the early Muslims who understood kind of that holistic care um, utilized, but they really developed it. And there's more we could share about therapy, but for me, that was kind of the big, <laughs> a big breakthrough, I would say. So you, I know, Dr. Rania, you have a deep understanding of the legacy of mental health that we've uh, inherited in our Islamic civilization. Give us a sense of some of the paradigms and theories that you uncovered and then we're able to see parallels off as you were going through your rotation and residency. Yeah. The, um, for me, subhanAllah, the, the, some of the things we were able to uncover, as you mentioned, I wanted to understand when a person in a traditional Muslim society historically had what today would be a mental health issue, what did they do? How were they treated? How did others around them get treated? Uh, treat them and what kind of care was there even and what that led to was an entire <laughs> line of their line of uh, you know research that's in my lab that's specifically focused on historical understandings of mental illness and another line that's called islamic psychology uh, amongst the you know 12 other lines that are in our lab of, for research but those two lines there it was amazing to be able to understand that the muslims when they talked about what today you call psychology, which is the root word in Greek, right? The psyche for them also meant the spirit and the soul. And logia is the study of. So psychology was the study of the spirit and soul. The Muslims called this in Arabic, ilmun nafs, the study of the self. <laughs> it wasn't that far apart. It's only in modern Western psychology, unfortunately, that modern psychology loses its soul, quote unquote, that they stopped really talking about this. But early on, Muslims and non-Muslims were both working on this. And what you find, it's very interdisciplinary. And that becomes important because you realize it's not just the physicians that are working on or scientists who are working on psychology, like you find today. Usually this is housed, psychology is usually housed in the school of medicine, right? Mm -hmm. Or in the schools of sciences, but you clinical psychology. But when you look historically in Muslim heritage, you find that actually it was interdisciplinary. You had physicians contributing, but you also had your scholars of religion contributing. This mm -hmm. is very important, right? But they're also writing on spirituality and spiritual understandings of the psyche. And you also have your philosophers contributing. Without going into a big story, I'll just say that the flavor of Islamic psychology actually is very different and more holistic than our modern psychology today. Mm -hmm. And so what we uncovered in all of that is the treatments that they had, the classification of illnesses and diagnoses, and also the treatments re reflected that. It wasn't just medications. It wasn't just, here's a pill, it'll solve your problem. There was therapy, talk therapy, because that was powerful and a powerful tool for treatment. But so was, so was using all your other senses. If that's a cognitive sense, what about your eyes, your nose, your ears, your taste, so on. And so they had sound therapy or what today we'd call music therapy. Mm -hmm. The Muslims did that. They actually had that as part of their main treatment process and customized it to specific mental illnesses. They used um, you know, color therapy and art therapy. And this is reflected in their institutions of healing, the Madistans. And I say all of this because when people realize how extensive the Muslim civilizations honored mental health mm -hmm. and treated it, all of those stigmas start to <laughs> fade away, <laughs> subhanAllah. Do you think your founding of Madistan has been able to capture some of these varieties of therapies? This is our goal, inshallah. This will be a long, a long process. If you can imagine, the Madistans were founded, the very first of them, um, which are the Islamic hospitals. Some say that they're in the 7th century, some in the 8th century. There's some discrepancy historically. But the point is, right after the advent of Islam, and they go everywhere Islam goes. They become a fixture of the Islamic societies, the way your mosques do, the way your madrasas do. Mm -hmm. So are your Madistans. They go everywhere Islam goes. Yeah. All throughout the Muslim world, all into Muslim Europe, everywhere that Islam was. And therefore, <laughs> they are there as an institution of healing all the way until the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And then you start to see kind of the cropping up of what today would be the modern hospital system, which, by the way, the blueprint used is the Madistan, mashallah. <laughs> but then you have kind of a neglecting of that very holistic institution. So to answer your question, it'll take us some time to rebuild and revive that heritage. But that's absolutely my goal, inshallah. Inshallah. I sincerely hope so. You know, I've been a student of history and, you know, we've learned about the the empire of forests, the, the taxation system, the agriculture, the architecture. Mm-hmm. But never in my textbook have I come across the institution of the Madistan. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Yes. Inshallah, our new book is coming out um, in about a year from now. We're cur- currently working on it. Alhamdulillah, we've signed a contract for it. And inshallah, in time, th- there will be a very robust resource <laughs> on the Madistans, inshallah. So now we're speaking in the Nisa context. What does your Madistan today offer survivors of domestic violence? Definitely and very important. The, you know, in a previous iteration of the work I did in the community, we had an MOU, a memorandum of understanding with Nisa. And I would love to see this be the case for our organization at Madistan, but really for any um, organization that has mental health that has nearby to it a local Muslim uh, organization focused on domestic violence. I really think that the two have to work hand in hand. In the previous work that I did, I saw that when there was this memorandum of understanding, you had um, a shared therapist and you had shared work. So if somebody needed that assistance and help, that specialized assistance and help, there was a, a, a direct channel of care and services. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of my goal Absolutely as well. In addition, of course, to programming like this and education and so on. But the direct services is really key. So I want to dig a little bit into this relationship that um, domestic violence survivors have <coughs> with, the, with God, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, you know, through some, some of the spiritual halakas that Nisa's organized, we found that many survivors of hardship uh, individuals that are struggling are disappointed in God and they're prone to giving up on faith. How would you advise them to reconnect to their creator? This is such an important question, Munira, honestly. It is so common. I want to, for first, first, first thing I want to say is it is so common for when a person goes through any sort of trial or tribulation to disconnect, to question, to ask why me or how come, or is God still seeing me, helping me, what's happening? I say that only to normalize that these are normal emotions. And so much so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about them in the Quran and showed us through the prophets that they too asked questions, that they too wondered why it is that they had difficulties that have come to them, that they too were taught, of course, to be patient and to persevere through it but it didn't mean that they didn't feel emotion with it. In fact, there was a lot of sorrow and grief and heaviness that so many of our prophets who we learn in our Islamic tradition to be the best of all of humanity, right? The best of all people. And if the best of all people have heavy emotions of sorrow and grief and really questioning, you know, if this is, if this heavy load that they received is worth it in some ways, then imagine the ordinary person like us, right? And so I say all of this to just normalize that these are norm- that this is bound to happen. But the beautiful thing about our Islamic tradition is there's also help. Stories, we have a lot of stories of the prophets and we have a lot of du'as that we're taught to recite and just moral character traits that we're taught in how exactly to persevere through difficulty. And we're also taught advocacy. We're taught to advocate for ourselves, to speak up, to get help, and not to um, shy away from that, whether it be something happening to ourselves or someone that we know and our loved ones. Sometimes it's also a, an abandonment from our own communities when something like this happens. We find that there's no one there to support us. Mm-hmm. And so that, too, needs to be anecdoted. So anyhow, I hope that, you know... Um, in understanding that the, the, how, how normal this is, but also knowing that there is, in fact, help through it, it really starts a person to feel that they can be reconnected again. Talk to us, Dr. Vanya, 
about um, why suicide is a taboo topic in the Muslim community. SubhanAllah, that is definitely one of the most difficult conversations of all. Um, I call suicide, and this is where before I talk, I'd like to just give a trigger warning. We probably should have given this one even before this topic here um, to just say that, you know, what we what we have been talking about these last few minutes actually is pretty heavy. And so I just want to invite anyone who feels that they have been triggered or it's difficult to take a step away and pause for a bit and rejoin us when they can. Like the topic of domestic violence, uh, suicide is also a difficult topic. I call it personally the taboo within the taboo. It's even within mental health and mental health is now getting more airtime than it ever has before in the society in general, but definitely in our Muslim communities much, much more than before. Um, and still more work has to be done. But suicide is still a big taboo. It's something that is often um, just hush hush. Or when you do start talking, if you try to talk about it, you're told, shh. Don't, don't, you know, we don't want to put ideas in people's heads, which of course the research has proven that that's never the case. Um, or it's just simply masked as something else, an accidental death of some sort. And when that happens, we don't ever really get to the root of the problem. We don't ever really get to why this is the case and what to do in order to help prevent. Because out of all the mental health conditions, Monita, it's really important for people to realize that suicide, out of all the mental health conditions we have, is 100% preventable. It's really, really key to understand that if we can do proper justice as communities in terms of awareness, prevention, and even intervention measures, we can avoid it altogether and not have to worry about postvention, which is basically what happens in a crisis mode after a suicide has happened. And so we have alhamdulillah materials on all three of these aspects that we developed in the lab and Madistan offers a training, of course, for this, for first line responders, community leaders, imams, and so on. Um, but I just want to say that again, if we can as a Muslim community not treat this as the taboo and have every so often have an awareness event, you're more likely to catch those who might be at risk well before they're actually at risk, well before they're actually at harm's way. Now, the findings of your research were published in JAMA, which is a prestigious medical journal, Journal of American Medical Association. Right. When you take those findings to Masajid, how is your work received by the audience? More than before, I would say, and, these, and perhaps this is an effect of the pandemic, it's much more received now than it had been in the past. In fact, um, I say this, and those who are on the on our promo video know this, um, that you know we have a we have a, a little video on our website at Madison where we have a series of imams, shaykh, and shaykhat, and ustadas who are. Um, talking about the importance about suicide and awareness in the Muslim community and to get the trainings for it. And all of them have actually been through our trainings. But, you know, what I say is really important in that just a few years prior to that, trying to have that same conversation that sometimes even with some of the very same people had been impossible. It was very difficult. And it was something that was, you know, you know, we don't, you know, it's, it's almost like out of sight, out of mind. We don't want to see it. We want to think about it. However, before the pandemic, certainly, but definitely during the pandemic, it became really, really clear that the levels of isolation that people were feeling, the loneliness, the being kind of, um, we saw the spikes in numbers in the general global community, the general national community, and certainly our own community. And our JAMA paper reflected some of that, where there was definitely an increase in the Muslim population, American Muslim population that we had seen ever before. And to try to understand what that is and how to prevent it became really important. And so did your findings tell you something about how the suicide rate amongst American Muslim adults compares to suicide rates in society at large? Yes, it was a cross-sectional study partnered with the ISP, the Institute of Social Policy and Understanding, as well as with some other organizations. And in our findings, we were, it was cross-sectional in that you had Muslims compared with people of all other faith groups, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, Hindu. You also had people of no faith, atheists, agnostics, and they were all compared cross 
uh, side by side, cross sectionally. And the finding, which was very saddening actually, but when we have a lot of work to do to try to change this, was that Muslim Americans had twice the rate of suicide attempts than other faith groups, not deaths by suicide, that's not something we studied in that particular study, but rather attempts. And that, and of course, we know attempts. Increased attempts will lead to increased deaths at some point, right? So there was definitely a real um, concern there. And hence, they're really needing to, to drum up what we have as our campaign now on suicide awareness and prevention. Yeah. And what were some of your findings as to the reasons? The reasons is something that we are doing a parallel study to, to determine. So what I could tell you is what is in the literature so far, but the studies are still ongoing. And so when they're completed, I'd be happy to share more. So far, what we can find in the literature is two main things. The theories of suicide say that a feeling of increased levels of burdensomeness, feeling like someone is a burden on whether it's their own family, their own community, or even if you extend it globally, nationally, so on. Or number two, an increased sense of not feeling like you belong. Mm. And American Muslims, especially in the last several years, even before the pandemic, social, politically, the last several years, and then add to that a pandemic, those are all very real things that the American Muslim community broadly has been experiencing. So it was not, it was upsetting to see those numbers, but I get it's not altogether shocking. Mm. Is there a causal relationship between domestic violence and suicide? There's definitely a causal relationship, not that one that we studied in that particular study, but in general, there are connections. Okay. Ooh, thank you. I think, I, as you said, the, the last 10, 12 minutes of our conversation have been heavy. Um, but thank you for, for allowing me to take you down that road and delve into some of these questions that have, that have been on, on my mind. I I did want to explore, uh, you know, this, you know, some, something different with you. You've pursued classical Islamic studies in Damascus, Syria. You've served as the first female professor of Islamic law at Zaytuna College. Um, you're a founding member of Rahma Foundation. Tell us, I the, the way I understand your spiritual work um, is that it's it's sort of it's you know it's women focused and women centered, and you know to to borrow um, uh, Western humanities language, this is feminism in its own right. Or has has have you ever been labeled as a Muslim feminist? Do you do you uh, you know do you readily take it on? Do you think this you know you bypass it? You do your own thing. What's going on over here in this very powerful, women centered, women led spiritual experience? Yeah, it's 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 exactly as you said. Inshallah, it is a woman centered, woman powered, woman empowered experience, and I find no need for labels. Personally, the the reality is, I say this is what I've heard my teachers say too, and I love it. You know, the proof is in the pudding. Mm. If there is something that is strong and empowered, and and literally shakes up a community around you, you know what I mean? It makes people think differently and brings them into a fold. Empower them really is the word I'm looking for here. Spiritually, think about as you mentioned, you had mentioned joining some of our, you know, Qiyam programs or Ramadan programs and where you're surveyed, you're able to see so many different types of women from all different walks of life in terms of women scholars and perhaps even pray behind them and be able to feel motivated by their words. This in itself is an experience that when we say the proof is in the pudding, if you can taste it, it's there. I don't need to put anything extra on it, spice it up in any other way, or put anybody else's labels onto them. Certainly every term carries its own baggage and has its own um, strings attached. I don't need strings attached here because I know what I'm, what's being represented here is really that Islamic tradition that I saw firsthand having traveled as a young person to Damascus. And I was amazed and awed in awe of all these women scholars who were memorizing the Quran and able to teach. And I don't, you can't see my, my bookshelf behind me, but the number of women scholars that have authored heavy hitting Islamic texts mm. and studies. 
And when people say, where are the women scholars of Islam? And I would just sort of point to my bookshelf and go, they're right there. <laughs> they're right there. <laughs> Mashallah. But to be, to, but to connect people to even realize that, because here in America, I find that sometimes we're disconnected from those experiences. And so a lot of the work of the Rahma Foundation was to do just that, provide a platform for women scholars and teachers and for other women and girls and girls to be connected to that and be empowered by it. Share with us a, a personal story or a moment where it really where you said, wow, uh, this work is really overturning secular feminist assumptions about Muslim women. Um, yeah, yeah. Or some of that work is to overturn. Yeah, yeah, where you said, yeah, this is just like, I'm, you know, we're doing, this is women empowerment in our own way. And when it's just, because sometimes you, when you're in the weed of doing things, it doesn't really, you know, hit, you, you don't appreciate what it is that you're doing until something, somebody else says something or does something and you say, whoa. Michelle, and you could take a step back. I, I hear you. I hear you very clearly. Um, and you know, I say our, our work here is still young and ongoing. But if I compare what you just said to what happened in Syria, especially after the war, subhanAllah, when after the war happened, it's exactly it's like people are on the go, go, go. And then suddenly something so major happened that made everybody essentially have to be spread all over the world. Literally, a lot so many of our teachers went to so many other parts of the world, you know, for safety reasons. And and, and then you could see so clearly what they had produced over decades of time. You know, the hundreds and hundreds of women that have become Quran scholars, the hundreds and hundreds that have become muhaddithat, people who are able to narrate all the chains of narration for hadith. You know, the hundreds, literally the hundreds who had become scholars of the utmost quality, um, whether it's sirah, tafsir, hadith, fiqh, you, you name it. Um, you know, when you take a step back and you realize how many women had been, were raising now families in which their the girls and their boys were affected by this beautiful spiritual awakening. Mm. Then you take a step back and you realize how much actual work had actually happened, subhanAllah. And anyhow, I say this because... Um, I forget sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll go, I'll take a small tangent, but a good friend of mine that many of you know, uh, Sheikha Maria Amir Ibrahimi released an app this past Ramadan called the Qariya app, right? It was an app that had the entire Mus'haf read in um, women's voices, scholars of the Quran who are women, who are reading you know, either whole surahs or portions of it. The reason I say this whole story, there was so much excitement around that app because so many women and girls had said, I've never heard the Quran recited by a woman. In the way you might hear on your Quran app that a man recites or at the masjid that the imam might read. And I thought to myself, and I was one of the biggest, you know, advocates and cheerleaders for this app. <laughs> but I was so amazed every time I would hear that, I'd say, what? And I'd realize the experience I had in Damascus and Syria was so different than so many women that had never actually let alone met a sheikha, let alone heard somebody who had actually was a woman scholar of Quran that had an ijaza in it and was teaching it and reciting it beautifully the way you might hear the men recite. And that's when you take a step back and you go, wow, what happens here was a beautiful sense of empowerment. And I don't need the kind of labels and terms that come with it baggage that may um, dilute some of that excellent empowerment or try to phrase it or stuff it within a cup of something that it doesn't fit within. Because this is not an anti-man or an anti-anybody, for that matter, kind of effort. This is purely women being connected to their Lord and to sisterhood. Dr. Vanya, you've seen the tragedy of war literally abruptly stop this scholarship from flourishing. You've you work closely, probably on a daily basis, with individuals who are dealing with mental health crises, including suicide. How does that affect your worldview? Yeah, the work, the work of you know anybody who's experienced um, war-torn situations, and I, my experience is really nothing more than simply wanting to give back and to do something after. It, all this happened to a country and to people that had given me so much. And so some of my mental health work has been focused on refugee mental health, in which I would travel back, uh, mm -hmm. not directly into Syria, but to neighboring countries in Jordan and some of the efforts have now gone into Lebanon and Turkey, where there were a lot of Syrian refugees and really just trying to um, 
talk about the invisible wounds of mental health trauma. Um, and yes, it does sh change your worldview and it kind of shapes it and gives it uh, another edge, if you will. Um, there's so many stories. I won't take all the time here today, of course, to share the stories, but I've learned so much from the resilience of people that have gone through those situations, even spiritually. Mm -hmm. Like I've been, I've been in situations where I'm doing a psychiatric assessment, you know, purely mental health, if you will, for somebody who's trying to seek asylum status, you know, in a, in a safer country and felt that I, it was like I was sitting in front of a sheikha receiving spiritual education from the kind of resilience and mindset and worldview that a person who's had all the terrible things this world can do to you have done to them. And still be able to say, Alhamdulillah, and I rely on God for the next steps. When you hear that kind of strength in those words, it's not its not just hot air. It's not just saying, you know, kind of doing lip service to these words. It's someone who's been through real deep trauma. And they are also coming through and getting help, by the way, and therapy and all the rest we talked about for that trauma. But when they say those words, I depend on Allah. That is not lip service. That is truly their aid coming through to the point that I had to sit back and go, wow, you say alhamdulillah to each of these terrible things you've just told me and be taught by them. Well, what else do you say? You're right. They're right. They're absolutely right. And those moments are, are you know, you can't quite, I, there's nothing in my clinic or nothing in my studies that I can compare them to. Real life learning. We're, we're almost um, approaching the hour. I'm going to ask you um, some of my just, you know, some questions that, that'll bring our, our conversation to full circle and give us some food for thought moving forward. What would you like to see done more in the community to make topics such as mental health, suicide, domestic violence more amenable for, for discussion? More and more education, definitely, definitely. The more we talk about this openly, and I welcome this conversation, and I consider you all to be very courageous to take it on. In fact, the work the whole organization is that is incredibly good, courageous and important. Um, I want to see more of this work and conversations at all of society's levels, all of our communities' levels. So whether it be with the scholarly level, the imams, whether it be the leadership you know, those who hold some sort of title in the community. I want to see it more on the youth side in their discussions. I want to see it more with our aunties and uncles. I want to see it in different languages. I want to see it with different sectors of the society. I want it to be in different corners in which, you know, there could be a, a get together and there's some chit chatting happening and mental health becomes a topic of conversation and people check in on each other and they ask each other, you know, or they suggest to each other, hey, we know some resources, can we help connect you, right? For people to even have a common language, that that's something that's even brought up, we still have some ways to go, but I'll tell you, having been doing this for a few decades now, it's, it's a lot more than it had ever been before. So I'm very hopeful, actually, mm -hmm. you know. I also think that on an institutional level, when you have organizations collaborating, look at today's collaboration between Nissa and between Maristan. When you have organizations collaborating, you bring the best of both worlds and you kind of make it even better, right? Mm -hmm. You connect even deeper. Um, we may not have all the resources on domestic violence. You have that. But we, we may have some mental health resources you may not have, and we kind of bridge the two together. The more those collaborations happen, the stronger the services will be the more holistic and quality they will actually be, inshallah. Can you give us some food for thought uh, on how one could feel driven to have some of these conversations by from from draw, how one could draw strength for this conversation from within their spiritual self? Yeah, definitely. I think for me, that's what I go back to all the time is the spirit in order to like fuel kind of like a, a car going running on empty. How do you refuel yourself? It's, it's from the spiritual conversation, honestly, it's, it's, and I encourage people to do this when you are able to tap into that, all the beautiful tools that this religion has given us 
I know people try today to do meditation and whatnot, and we have our own forms of contemplative meditation and other forms of connecting with God. You feel you find yourself refueled and you're able to take on heavier and more difficult, even just aspects of your own life. Forget anybody else's or the communities, just even your own circles. And that's where the conversation actually starts. If people were to say, and to your earlier question, Manita, too, I'll add this. If people were to say, I'm going to start this with my own family, this conversation, my own friend circle. Mm. We've all been, we've all been affected by the pandemic. There is nobody here that hasn't had some mental health effect of the pandemic. What if I started my own circles asking now that people are coming more and more out of the pandemic and back out into society and things are resuming, you know, to say, how, how is your mental health? I mean, just as direct as that sometimes, or if you need to, couch it in some way because it's an elder or someone to do so but to ask how is someone actually doing and not to be worried I love by the way I had a Stanford student reach out to me just the other day and say I was helping them with something uh, difficult and serious and then they (laughs) reached out and said Dr. Dania how are you doing and I thought wow mashallah to have someone much younger than you and someone who's you know um, in, in it might feel odd is like someone who's your elder, who's your teacher and so on to ask them, but it's so important because we're all human at the end of the day. What if we did that first? Mm. Our communities, our friends, our circles, our little get togethers and chit chats. Mm. Can you imagine the ripple effect that would happen? Mm. Mm. Sazarani, I feel like your spiritual tank always fills up others. (laughs) Whether one comes out of your Friday night qiyam or Ramadan qiyam or just, you know, any of your other works. And I, the, my, my takeaway from today's conversation has been as, it, uh, you know, there is the under, under, uh, really a holistic understanding of mental health. You, you refer to psychology, you refer to philosophy, you refer to therapy, and then spirituality at the same time. And in your, in your um, halakas or qiyams, you've always, you've, you've insisted on highlighting both the, the, the secular knowledge of your speakers, so to speak, or the science that they're grounded in, as well as their spiritual work. And I really appreciate all of that that you do. Would you like to close our conversation uh, with the dua? I would love to. I would love to, inshallah. And thank you. At first, I, before I do that, I just wanted to say thank you again to Nisa. Thank you, Munita. And thank you to, I know, um, you know, all those, your whole, I know there's a whole, usually there's a whole team behind these efforts. So I'm thanking everybody in the background as well. And I just want to say too, um, before we do the dua, that I hope that these, this is a start of many more conversations like this, because any one of the topics we touched on, it's not conclusive or enough, right? And so forgive my shortcomings, please, inshallah. And hopefully they just opened up our, our thoughts a little bit more. So with that, we'll close inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. Oh Allah, we ask via Kareem to shower your mercy down upon us and to accept us, Ya Rabbil Alameen, to connect us to those, to, to, to connect us, Ya Rabbi, in all meaningful ways, Ya Rabbi, to goodness. Ya Rabbi, allow us, Ya Kareem, to be from those who are guided on your straight path and allow us, Ya Rabbil Alameen, to be from those who are forgiven. Ya Allah, we ask you to be from those who are empowered and from those, Ya Rabbil Alameen, that can advocate for themselves and for others. Ya Rabbi, we ask you, Ya Kareem, to protect us and to protect our families and to protect our friends and our loved ones. Ya Rabbi, we ask you to be from those who are always in service of others. Allow us, Ya Rabbil Alameen, to use our time and our effort and our knowledge and our strength and our efforts, Ya Rabbil Alameen, in serving our families, our communities and humanity, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Rabbi, we ask you for the best in all of this dunya and in the best in the akhirah and to relieve us, Ya Rabbil Alameen, from trials and tribulation and allow us, Ya Rabbi, to see the fruits of our labor in the akhirah. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. Ameen. Jazakallah khairan sazarani. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. My pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much again. Salam. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.